Um, welcome everybody. Uh, so we've got some, uh, this is, well, we're kicking off uh, the first session of um, Sean Anagans or Mini Moral, so Croeso. Um, so this evening, uh, we've got two very uh, interesting speakers. Um, and sorry, I'm just gonna keep admitting people from the waiting room. Uh, we've got two really interesting speakers. So we've got Steve Truella and Julie Hatcher, uh, authors of The Essential Guide to Beachcombing in the Strand Line, which uh, a lot of you may know. I know we certainly use it a lot at work and we know a lot of people that, that do. And um, more recently, The Essential Guide to Rock Pooling, which is another great book, and also in the company of seahorses as well. Um, so Steve is a, um, he's a photographer and a diver as well, but specifically photographs uh, marine uh, wildlife. And Julie is a marine biologist and also a diver. So together they've found lots of lots of interesting things and things that um, haven't ever been recorded on British beaches before. So uh, they should have a really fascinating talk for us tonight. Um, so without further ado, and I just have to apologize for my screen as well, because I seem to have some bizarre yellow lens over the front of me tonight. But um, yeah, without further ado, I shall hand over to Julie and Steve. Thank you. Um, hello, and thank you for inviting us to uh, speak to you. I hope everyone can hear us okay. Um, we're going to show you some of our photos. Well, Steve's photos, I think they're all Steve's. Um, so uh, we're going to show a PowerPoint. So I'm going to go to share screen. If you just bear with us for a minute. Um, there we go. This, Hopefully, hopefully everyone can can see that. Um, so thank you for the introduction. Um, what we're going to be talking about this evening is uh, about beachcombing. You know, everybody's done this, walked along the beach and come across some bizarre, mysterious looking thing lying on the beach, being washed up by the waves. And uh, quite often we wonder what on earth it is, where has it come from, how has it got there? So hopefully we're going to answer a few of those questions uh, this evening. We're going to talk about some of the things that you commonly find on the seashore. So wherever you are around the UK, you know, things that wash up um, regularly and they're from kind of local origin. Uh, we're also going to talk about things that wash up from a long way away, things that live way out in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, uh, and even things that travel right across from North America. So what we call um, long haul or, or long distance uh, travellers and, dri and, and ocean drifters. Um, we're going to touch a little bit on litter, but I'm sure everybody is, is very aware of the problem of uh, litter in the sea these days. And uh, so I'm just going to briefly talk about that. Uh, and then we're going to talk about the strand line as a habitat. So the strand line is that line of debris that gets washed up onto the beach by the tide and, and the waves and then stranded there. Um, and it's an extraordinary habitat. So we're gonna talk briefly about that as well. We're gonna have lots of time for questions at the end. Uh, so, and if anybody's got anything that they found while they've been beachcombing to show us, then, then that's great. Okay, so we're gonna start by, how do I move on to the next? I'm going to start by talking about some of the commoner things that you find washed up on the beach. Um, and I'm sure you'll all recognise this as a crab. In fact, it's a crab molt. So it's the empty exoskeleton uh, of a, a shore crab, this one. Um, but you find, you know, all different kinds of, of species of crab um, have molted and you find their molts washed up on the beach, sometimes with all the legs and the claws and everything attached, sometimes just the carapace. Um, and 
you know, for those who, who don't know, um, crabs live inside this hard casing. It's like a suit of armour, uh, their exoskeleton. Um, but as they grow, it doesn't stretch and grow with them. So at some point, it's going to end up feeling very tight and they're feeling rather squeezed and squashed inside of a small shell. Uh, so periodically, oh. periodically, I hope you can hear us, our internet connection is a bit uh, iffy, I'm afraid. Um, but periodically, as they're growing, they have to molt their shell, leave it behind and grow a new bigger Heart, you know, a new bigger shell. So what they do is when they're ready to molt, um, they start to dissolve a seam at the back of the carapace and then they split it open and, and they climb out backwards. Uh, and as I said, they leave the legs, the eye coverings, everything behind. And what's left is, is what looks exactly like a dead crab on the beach. And sometimes people walk along the beach and think, oh my God, what's happening? There's loads of dead crabs on the beach. But actually what it is, is just a load of molts where the crabs have been growing, especially in summer. Um, obviously they're feeding and growing very quickly. Although you can find these, you know, all year round. Um, so crab molts is something that you can always find on the beach. And it's a really good way to get to know your crabs as well by looking at the different shapes and the different colors uh, of the malts that you find uh, and identifying the different species. Something else that I guess um, most people are familiar with are mermaid's purses. Uh, and here is the uh, a mermaid's purse. It's actually the empty egg case of a type of shark uh, called a, a bull hus. And um, it has those curly tendrils at the end. So we have two types of shark in this country that lay eggs and they're egg, empty egg cases. Once the babies have hatched and swum away, the empty egg cases wash up onto the beach for us to find, uh, usually mixed in with the seaweed along the strand line. Um, and there is a different type of, oh, just before that uh, this is what's hatched out of it. So uh, a small shark, a, a type of cat shark, um, will have hatched out of that egg. Uh, and each egg capsule contains a single embryo. The other type of mermaid's purse um, are these kind of darker coloured ones with the pointy corners. They don't have the curly tendrils of the shark eggs. Um, but these are the egg cases of uh, a, a fish related to sharks. They are the skates, or we call them rays as well. Um, so there are a number of species of skate that lay eggs. And again, we get their empty egg cases washing up on the beach. We call them mermaid's purses. Uh, and you can tell by the size and the shape uh, of these egg cases, which species of skate they have come from. And actually, it's really important that we, uh, we record these because by doing that, we can find out where the important breeding and nursery areas are for these very vulnerable species. I mean, rays and skates are very vulnerable to overfishing. Um, so knowing where their breeding areas, their spawning areas are, um, is really important to their conservation. Um, now, Mostly, almost always, in fact, these egg cases are empty when they wash up on the beach. And actually, if you look closely, you can see where the baby has, has swum out of them, has, has burst, burst them open and swum out. But very, very, very rarely you find one uh, with the embryo still inside. And we've been lucky enough to find two of these, actually. Um, and one of them, we actually managed to, the, the embryo that was inside the egg, um, we popped it into an aquarium tank and we watched it develop inside, feeding off the yolk that's inside the egg and growing, uh, pumping, beating its little tail uh, inside the egg case to uh, oxygenate the water, to bring 
fresh seawater in um, so that it could breathe the oxygen. And eventually, well, after a couple of months or so, um, the baby hatched out and it was a small, uh, really tiny little baby and it was a spotted ray. Uh, and this is a photograph of it here. Uh, alongside the egg case is actually half buried in the gravel just underneath it, you can just see. Uh, and of course, once, we, once the baby had hatched, we released it into the sea um, and watched it swim away. So hopefully it survived. It had a second chance of, at life after washing up uh, in its egg case after a storm. Uh, so it's always worth checking if you're picking up mermaid's purses. Um, there's also a number of, of, besides the mermaid's purses, there's a number of beaches. Obviously, the intention um, from the parent isn't that they wash up on a beach out of water where they will dry up and die. Um, they're laid on the seabed uh, with the intention that they'll stay there until the babies hatch. Um, but at this time of year, lots of these things will be washing up all around the coast. Uh, and these are called sea wash balls. And they're called that because in olden times, apparently sailors used to pick them up uh, and use them like we use bath sponges today. So if you, they might get dried up while they're washed up on the beach, uh, but if you pop them in water, they'll soak up the water like a sponge uh, and you can have a wash with it. I'm not sure I would fancy doing that, but apparently that's what used to happen. So sea wash balls. Um, but actually what they are is a, an egg mass um, that's laid by the common whelk or bucky and common whelks gather together in numbers and lay a big mass of, of these little uh, capsules all glued together into a ball. So it's not just one individual that's laid all these and each little sort of lens shaped capsule um, that's, that's part of that ball will have tens of thousands of eggs inside it and only a few of the eggs will actually be fertilized. Most of them are there for food so once the, the babies start to hatch out they'll feed on the rest of the eggs, the unfertilized eggs, um, to give them a good start before they sort of head off into the big wide world. You may have come across these eggs as well, uh, like a little bunch of grapes. In fact, they are called sea grapes. And um, each grape, if you like, is an individual egg uh, with a little baby cuttlefish inside. So these are cuttlefish eggs, common cuttlefish. And occasionally they get washed up uh, especially in seaweed. So the cuttlefish uh, mother would have laid the eggs in a cluster attached quite robustly to seaweed, sometimes to um, fishing pots and rope uh, or to eelgrass in eelgrass beds. But of course, if it's really stormy, they can get detached and, and wash up onto the beach where they will die. Uh, again, we've had quite a bit of success with picking these up and popping them into a, a fish tank uh, and watching the babies hatch out. And another, another type of egg that you quite often see, or at least we do quite often see washed up on the beach are these rather sort of slimy looking sausage shaped things. These are squid eggs and each sausage is packed full of uh, individual eggs um, that will eventually again it's not one individual laying all these but a, a lot of squid will get together uh, and lay these in a big cluster uh, on the seabed anchored to the seabed uh, and as I said sometimes they get washed out um, and washed up onto the beach. Hi, um, I'm going to speak about the, the oceanic animals that come in. Obviously, Judy's been talking about the things that wash up on, on sort of local beaches, you know, the mermaid's purses and things. Um, a lot of animals 
with the Atlantic Ocean between us and America, we have all these oceanic sort of drifting animals. Uh, these, these little blue things on the beach are called by the wind sailors or Valella Valella. Um, they're often sort of classed, they are a, a colonial siphonophore. They're a very odd group of animals. So they're, they're a sort of colony of animals, um, all living under one sort of mass. Um, they're loosely related to hydroids. Um, but they're definitely not jellyfish. Jellyfish uh, live under the water. Whereas this group of animals are quite unique and they are plustonic. And plustonic is, it means that the animal occupies air and water simultaneously. There's only a handful of animals in the world that live that life. Jellyfish live under the water, other animals live on the surface. There's very few that live on the surface and underwater. And they generally have sort of sails. And that's what you see on this picture here are the little sails that they're the volumes. I mean, some of the... These slits are so big out in the Atlantic that you can see them from Solella on beaches in the UK. And it's often worth looking for the violet sea snail, which feeds on them. And there's also a rare sea slug as well, a, pelagic sea slug called Fiona, um, which, which will feed on these and Portuguese man of war. So if you see clusters of these, it might be worth sort of sitting around and having a poke around because uh, they are quite extraordinary animals. The tentacles are, are underneath the animal, so they have these stinging cells. And they basically just drift along the ocean. They have no control about where they go. They rely totally on the, on the winds. And some have left-handed sails and some have right-handed sails. So all Valella don't end up in the same place. And obviously if there's a stranding, the one with one or the other sail will hopefully be carrying on off to sea while the others wash up on the beach. So they're, they're quite extraordinary animals and very little is known about their, their life cycle. The other one you'll be familiar with is, is this animal. This is the Portuguese man of war. Um, these, these are my favourite things. I, this is my sort of favourite animal. It's a plutonic animal, so it has this, this float, this CO2 filled float on the surface. Um, and beneath that, it has a, a whole array of, uh, well, a colony like the Valella has a colony of digestive glands and reproductive glands. and all these things going digestive glands. So all these things are all going on and they're all kind of independent um, of each other, although they are the same animal, very, very bizarre. The Portuguese man of war is the only one. It's, it has no other animals in its class. So it's, that's it, Portuguese man of war, it's on its own. It's quite a unique animal. And the sails on the top, um, we've had these things in, in aquariums when they're stranded, just, just to observe them really and photograph and film them. And if you blow on them, the float at the top will actually tack in to the wind that you're creating. So it will, it will form a crescent shape as you blow it. If you walk around the other side of the tank and blow it again, the float will curl around again, which, which is amazing. I always find that amazing because these things have no eyes or brain or they're not, they're not com compatible to any other animal. Um, but they but they function exceptionally well. They can be very large. They can be the size of a sort of rugby ball, um, and they can have about thirty meters of, of stinging tentacles. They are potentially very very dangerous. If you see one washed up on a beach or in the water, it's, it's probably best to avoid it. Um, you know, I have picked them up by the float, but I wouldn't recommend anyone pick them up at all because often the tentacles are entangled around the float or in the seaweed or so, so, you know, use a stick maybe, poke it around and get it out to see we photograph or observe the noise, they are best left alone. Um, this is obviously a true jellyfish. Um, in Wales, you probably get quite a few of these. I'm hoping you can hear me still, internet's gone down again. Um, this is the barrel jellyfish. Uh, Britain's sort of not the longest jellyfish, but it's the largest jellyfish. Its body mass is 
huge. Um, anyone who's, most people have probably seen these washed up on beaches. And they're called dustbin lid jellyfish for good reason, because they are the size of a dustbin. And they probably weigh as much as one when it's filled up with rubbish as well. They're very, very heavy. They are obviously basically water. Um, but they're, again, they're quite extraordinary things. Um, we get sort of fluctuations in population. Some years you'll get thousands of them, and other years you won't see any at all. Um, and I think in 2015, 16, there were thousands and thousands of them all around the UK. We, we had hundreds in Dorset. Um, and they're, again, they're, they're a fantastic thing to spend time with if you get the opportunity to go snorkeling with them. Um, they are extraordinary. I can spend hours and hours and hours in the water with one of these things. Um, and there are little tiny crustaceans that living in these ones and other jellyfish. So again, if you see one stranded, it's worth sort of pulling it apart. You, I mean, you can't hurt it. It's dead anyway. Um, and you get these little tiny crustaceans called Hyperia galba or big eye amphipod. And they're just like a sandhopper with big green eyes. And they live inside jellyfish. They feed on the jellyfish, but they're they're quite insignificant to an animal of this size. So it's worth looking, you know, kicking old jellyfish over and seeing if you can find the little amphipods underneath them. And uh, this is why I like them, because when they're on the beach, they're not particularly colourful or dynamic and, and really, you know, something and nothing. When you see one of these animals in the water, um, they are extraordinary. And again, jellyfish don't have brains or like we do they don't have eyes you know when you see people saying oh i had these jellyfish coming towards me they were just drifting towards you as opposed to they've seen you and they're chasing you um jellyfish can't chase you because uh, they don't know you're there but they probably do know you're there because when you're snorkeling with them they will often submerge so they'll be up on the surface and sometimes they will go they can probably pr pick up the pressure and even maybe temperature in the water i'm not a jellyfish biologist but but they certainly know that you're there and they will dive. Um, but again, if you get the opportunity to get in the water with one of these things and um, just swim around, they're not particularly, all jellyfish sting you. Um, you'd be very unlucky to, to be stung by one of these. The only time I've ever been stung is where I've, I've once bumped into me or I pushed one away and the, you get the sting on your fingers or on your gloves and then you rub your lips when you get out of the water. It's just a tingle. But jellyfish in general, you know, best avoid touching them for their sake and yours. Um, something else you're probably all quite familiar with are goose barnacles. I'm always amazed when I go on Facebook and see endless pictures of barnacles, goose barnacles on beaches with everyone saying, what are these? Because they do wash up more or less everywhere in the UK, maybe not so much on the East Coast, um, but they are pretty common after after big weather um, to see goose barnacles attached to all sorts of things. Um, goose barnacles only, or these, these sort of oceanic goose barnacles are various species. They only live on floating objects. So they're not the same as the goose barnacles that grow on rocks in the Mediterranean in the intertidal zone. And many people often say, oh, keep them, they're worth a fortune. They're really expensive, they're not. They're not the same species, and I certainly wouldn't eat an animal that's been drifting around in the Atlantic Ocean in uh, microplastic and goodness knows what pollution. So certainly never eat one, um, but they are fascinating animals, and, and you often see massive clusters on logs and fishing buoys. Even they'll have them on. They're probably one of the few animals that really benefit from marine litter, unfortunately. Uh, there aren't many things that benefit from marine litter, but I believe goose barnacles are probably having an absolute field day out there because 200 years ago, all they had was the odd coconut and a shipwreck um, or stuff that was getting thrown in the sea that was wooden and probably rotted long before it ever reached our shores. So now we have plastic fish boxes in their millions floating around out there than absolutely tons and tons of habitat for goose barnacles. And this is, this is the business end of a goose barnacle. So they're crustaceans. Uh, a lot of people think they're like mussels, that they're a, they're a mollusk. They are crustaceans, so they're related to crabs, prawns, lobsters, um, and the barnacles that live on the seashore. So like the barnacles that live on the seashore, they have these cirri or, or legs covered in tiny hairs. 
And when they're dangling beneath an object, they're opening this, this umbrella of tentacles up and just, just flicking it in the, in the current. And obviously at night, when the plankton rises in the water column, um, they're picking up all these, all these nutrients and, um, and they're very successful. They grow incredibly quickly um, because some of the jobs are objects that drift across have been timed. So they become heavily colonized in a year with thousands of barnacles. Um, but they are quite extraordinary. I, I, they're, and they're very attractive things to look at, I think. A lot of people looking at this picture might not think so, but, mm -hmm. um, but I certainly think they're fascinating. And uh, if you have a really good look, if you, I mean, people try and put goose barnacles back into the sea. And I know it seems a shame that they're all gasping on the beach and their little tentacles are hang, coming out. But ultimately, they are an oceanic species. They can't survive in inshore waters. It's too cold. Um, and also, they will ultimately just wash up on the beach. If you throw them back in the sea, they'll wash up five minutes later. Um, so it's worth, it's sometimes it's worth, if you find a big object, a big fishing boy or a log that's absolutely festooned with them, it's worth, it's worth having a rummage around in the barnacles and even cutting some off to see if there are any of these inside. This is a Columbus crab, um, native to, to really Sargasso and, and the warmer, you know, the Caribbean waters of the Atlantic. Um, they are an oceanic crab that only live on floating objects. You'll never see this crab on a reef or on the sand. It only lives on the surface water of the ocean, um, generally amongst goose barnacles, but you can also find them on loggerhead turtles and other turtle species where they'll tuck in underneath the legs or on the shell. Um, they'll come out of the water like, like the other crabs. They're, they're related to the Sally Lightfoot crabs. They're grapsid crabs. So they're happy to feed on algae. They'll graze on algae on the top of objects and they'll also feed on, on food waste of the barnacles and even the barnacles themselves. Um, they are quite a rare thing, but they're, I think they're more rarely recorded than rare. So they're definitely worth looking for. I've found hundreds and hundreds of these over the years by, by slicing barnacles off logs and they're, they're, and they're always alive. They always wash up alive, um, which is quite extraordinary when you think they've traveled five or 6,000 miles. You. So, um, we all know that there are wonderful things living in our oceans, um, and we all now know about the problems of plastic litter in the oceans as well. I'm not going to talk at, at length about litter, there's quite a large section in our book about different types of litter, most of it um, is litter that washes up here, having travelled all the way across the ocean from North America. Um, but of course, you can walk on any beach and find a plastic drink bottle. Um, and it's drink bottles are a huge problem. Um, they've increased in number, well, people picking them up on beach cleans have recorded them, and they've increased by 36%. Uh, since the 1990s and I notice in Scotland they are planning to introduce a deposit return scheme this April. Um, we're still waiting for, for our government in England uh, to commit to introducing a deposit return scheme for drink containers. Um, so yeah it's something that definitely needs to be done because it would make a huge difference, I feel, to the number of plastic bottles that wash up on beaches. Um, now, there's, there's no end of litter I could talk about, but I just want to mention uh, something that, that Steve did, actually. We were, um, we've been picking up a lot of the nurdles, the tiny plastic pellets, the pre-production uh, pellets uh, that are produced and, and are how plastic is transported around the world to factories to be made into products. And the fact that seabirds uh, in particular um, are very vulnerable to eating them, swallowing them, um, you know, by eating them they get a toxic meal because while the pellets are drifting around in the sea they're attracting pollutants 
that are kind of diluted by the sea, but they get concentrated on these plastic pellets. So anything that eats them is, is eating all of that, um, those toxins as well. Uh, and in particular, here in the UK, fulmers um, are very susceptible. They eat items from the surface of the sea. They aren't divers uh, like gannets, um, but they eat, they pick off food at the surface of the sea. And so they tend to accumulate lots of plastic in their stomachs. So Steve took it into his head to um, dissect a fulmer that he found on the on a local beach uh, and to dissect its stomach and this was just a random fulmer that he picked up and these were all of the plastic items that were in its tiny little stomach uh, including some nurdles you can see the little round pellets there some fishing line mono, monofilament fishing line um, some polystyrene and other bits of, of plastic so microplastics, of course, as we know, are a huge problem to um, our seabirds and other marine life. Um, and it's really at all of our responsibility to try and reduce the amount of plastic that we consume, um, whether it's whether we're recycling or whether it's going to landfill or somehow getting into the environment. We can all do our bit to reduce how much plastic uh, we buy. Right, um, I'll just talk about beach strand lines quickly. The, as Judy says, the beach strand line is the, the point of the highest tide, so the spring tide, where it deposits all of the, all of the natural and unnatural objects that have come out of the sea. It's predominantly seaweed and sticks and driftwood and, and all the rest of it, obviously all the litter there with, with it as well. Um, Beach strand lines, I, I've worked on beach strand lines and studied them for many years. And I believe them to be probably, I think they are our richest habitat for invertebrates. I've, I've never been to an ancient woodland or a pond or anywhere else where the concentration of insects and other, other sort of invertebrates uh, have been as high as a pile of rotten seaweed. If you kick a pot, you know, a rotten seaweed or lift a piece of driftwood up, it's absolutely teeming with, with sandhoppers, seaweed fly maggots, seaweed flies. That's just the stuff you can see. When you work down the scale to the springtails and the mites and all of these other sort of microscopic animals, um, it's an extraordinarily rich habitat. Also, the animals that live on beach strand lines tend to be endemic. So even the flies only live on seaweed strand lines. So I know people think flies are an annoyance and then they can be, um, but seaweed flies are seaweed flies. They're not the same as the flies you find in your house. Um, and they're certainly not a fly that should be necessarily associated with something being unhygienic or dirty, which flies generally are, um, which is unfortunate for flies because flies do a very good job of cleaning up our mess after us. Um, so this is a this is a seaweed fly flying. You've got no idea how hard it was to get this photo. Um, so I hope you appreciate it. <laughs> and seaweed flies lay their maggots, uh, their, their eggs rather, in, in the seaweed. They can smell it from miles away. So if there's a fresh stranding, they will they will migrate to other beaches, lay their eggs in the strand line, and the maggots will hatch out. Now they're incredibly resilient animals, the maggots to the point where they can float on the surface of the sea if there's a big spring tide and the seaweed gets dis disrupted they will they will bob around with the seaweed for all day and when the tide goes back out they'll settle back onto the beach and, and bury under the seaweed again they are they are you know very very resilient animals so when a beach gets flushed it doesn't necessarily in fact it rarely kills all of the insect life there um, it's all very resilient to salt water um, the other, the other really common animal on beaches is is the sandhopper. Now, sandhoppers are crustaceans. They they are uh, uh, same as the uh, what do you call them? Okay. Amphipod. They're an amphipod. Uh, most amphipods live in the sea. Um, hope you can hear me still. 
Definitely. Yeah, most amphipods live in the sea. We do have a few freshwater ones. They're this sort of curled round um, little shrimp like animals. Uh, sand hoppers are terrestrial. They are not a marine species. There are two common ones in the UK. Um, one you find tend to find on sandy beaches, the other you tend to find on kelp strand lines and rocky shores. Um, they can be very, very abundant, but they're also very, very vulnerable. Um, because they bury in the sand, uh, beach cleaning and, and even trampling uh, will, will ultimately damage their burrows and, and their habitat. It's actually quite sensitive. And there are issues around beach cleaning generally. I've got sort of mixed feelings about it. I realise that plastic ending up back in the ocean isn't a good thing. Uh, plastic being on a beach isn't a good thing. But the problem is if 100 people walk onto a beach and start walking along the beach strand line to pick the litter up, they are ultimately damaging the habitat that these and many, many other animals uh, rely on. So it's a kind of, it's a bit of a mixed bag. There are also issues, obviously mechanical beach cleaning is incredibly detrimental to beaches. Um, it's purely cosmetic. It, it serves no purpose whatsoever. Seaweed and, and twigs don't pose any threat to human health and they really should be left on beaches. And also there's a bit of an a sort of an obsession going around with the moment with, with the microplastics and removing them from beaches um, by using these sort of revolving drums with the, the filter out the, the sand. So you're just left with the with the nurgles and microplastics. Um, Again, if it's a fresh drift strand line where they're simply rummaging around at the top of the beach with a dustpan and brush and cleaning up all this stuff, you are, you are, like I say, potentially destroying these animals. And because they have gills like wood lice, they have to be in damp habitats. As soon as you expose a sandhopper to direct sunlight, and I have, I have spoken to people who clean beaches with these, these trommels, they're called, where they filter out the plastic and the sandhoppers, they say the sandhoppers just drop, drop on the tarpaulin and, and hop away. But the problem is those sandhoppers are hopping away probably many metres away from where they want to be. And that if they only have to be exposed to air for a short time, um, or certainly warm air, and they will just dry out and die, and they certainly get predated. So again, I've got mixed feelings about it. I mean, maybe pick up large objects, but uh, microplastics are a different thing. If, if it gets to the point where you're sterilizing the beach, um, you might be picking the plastic up, but, in, but, but by doing that, you are basically destroying the habitat that these animals rely on. Yeah. Um, and I would say other animals rely on it. This, the seabirds and coastal birds, this is a hugely important uh, habitat. Seaweed flies can be super abundant all the year round, even this time of the year, because the, sea, the seaweed acts like compost if it's warm so many insects live there all the year round which is a very very important food source for insectivores birds like this rock pipit um, the turnstones very familiar bird again they'll dig around in the beach for invertebrates and sand hoppers and probably even seaweed fly maggots um, and of course mammals you know small mammals this is a field vole that i photographed on our local beach a few years ago he was out at night. Um, everybody tells me field voles don't eat insects. This field vole was eating seaweed flies. Um, it was eating lots and lots of seaweed flies. So that's a bit of a nonsense. Um, and it was there specifically. It would have come down from undergrowth or the local the cliffs um, onto the beach at night to feed on this 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 you know abundance of insects. So again, by losing this habitat, by cleaning the seaweed up and trampling it all and losing it, you're losing the place where wintering animals can go and get food whenever they want. So it's, it's gotta be really careful there. And uh, finally, this is, this is an also a very important point of leaving seaweed and natural debris on beaches, especially sandy ones where there are sand dunes. Plants can't grow in sand. I don't know if you ever tried growing a plant in sand, but it doesn't grow. Sand has to have nutrients in it and those nutrients that create sand dunes um, 
are built up on on that on debris, on rotten seaweed and driftwood, all rotting down. The animals, the sandhoppers, all the small animals, break all that down into manageable nutrient levels. Um, and these pioneering plants, this is prickly saltwort on our local beach. Um, and because the sea with the seaweed's left on this beach, these pioneering genes can form. These are plants like cactuses that that hold a lot of water and they also collect sand. So in the winter, all this stuff covers up and it creates yet another dune and so on. So the process goes on, but by mechanically cleaning um, beaches with sort of things like this, you're, you're basically kissing goodbye to the dunes. So we've got climate change, rising water levels. And what do we do? We take all the seaweed and twigs off the beach because people think it's dirty and then the sound dunes start washing away so they put big metal cages at the top of the beach which are way more unsightly than seaweed and twigs mm -hmm. um so that's it i think we're done for now so if you want to ask some questions these are our facebook sites by the way so if you want to join our facebook sites um for each each of the books you can come on there you can contribute or you can see what we've been uh, we've been up to thank you right i'm going to stop sharing Lovely. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. That was um, that was a, a really, really good talk. And you'll be you'll be pleased to know that there were some very, uh, very nice comments about the um, the seaweed fly. So people were very impressed with that photo. <laughs> <laughs> there were there were some really, really lovely photos. And um, I yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah, if um, if people would like to do to do questions, um, I think probably the best way to do this is um, if people raise their hands on their on um, their function, if you know how to do that. I'm just having to look. Yeah, you can. You should be able to raise your hand, and then if we we come to you, um, and then we can unmute and um, and obviously show your video if you want to show your video as well. Um, Hang on, let's just do that. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'll just get used to that. <laughs> <laughs> I've got no idea what happened there. I'm gonna be very excited. Um, yeah. Sorry. So, um, Wendy, do you want to? Do you yes, want to go? Is there something that you would like to ask about? Um, have you ever found um, a, a message in a bottle anywhere? Because that's I've been on, um, you know, uh, beaches all around the world, and I've never found a message in a bottle yet. Yeah. Yeah, we have. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We get. We're not fans of messages in bottles because it means someone has thrown a bottle <laughs> into the sea. Um, so we tend to, if we do find one, we tend to take it and put it in a bin. What? Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, in, it it's interesting. First. Sorry. You read it first, though, and see where it's come from. Yeah, I have. I have done. Yeah. They're usually just nonsense, though. I've never. I've never found an interesting letter in a bottle. I mean, people <laughs> people do find them from Florida and all over the world. Um, I mean, it, it, it's it's kind of interesting to see how long objects take to come across the ocean, but the other half of me thinks, yeah, but it's, by doing that, and and by getting hundreds of likes on Facebook, it just encourages people to try and do the same. And I know a few years ago, there was a guy at Brighton Pier who was charging people to send a message in a bottle. So he was charging for the, a glass bottle, um, charging people to do a little message that had kind of customised. And then he was throwing, he was taking wheelbarrow fulls of bottles to the end of Brighton Pier and throwing them into the sea. But of course, Brighton, Brighton's on the east coast. All they did was wash up on south the beach, coast. on the south coast rather. But yeah, so that kind of, I'd say, yeah, it is interesting. I found them. I've, I've found, I've even found money in bottles where people have put a, a, a note from their country, in Moldova, mm -hmm. um, and it's quite interesting. But but ultimately, we haven't mentioned it in the book for that deliberate reasons. We just don't want people doing it. Yes. Um, yeah. It yes, is, it is interesting. I know it's in, I get it. And I'm sure years ago, it was kind of interesting, but now it's become a, a commercial thing where you can actually buy messages in bottles to write out yourself 
and then throw them in the sand. And I don't know, oh, no, you've seen no, the, da no. the damage glass does on beaches for kids and dogs. And, you know, I just think the last thing you want is a, is a glass bottle ending up on a beach. Yeah. Getting, yeah. So it's yeah. like it's like those um it's like those lanterns, you know, those um Yeah, yeah. Uh, in India they had they put those Chinese lanterns. Chinese lanterns, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, that was yeah. that's a big uh, that's a big uh, popular yeah. thing. Yeah, you're you're absolutely right. Yeah, I hadn't looked at it in that way. Yeah, yeah thanks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> thanks. That that was a yeah, that was a, a good question. Um uh Gretchen, did you have your hand up? Did you want to ask something? Yes, please. Um, with, when you were showing the goose barnacles and you showed the little crab, which is obviously a non-native species, what would you advise if you did find one? Yeah, that's a good question because I, I've, I, we've been sort of throwing the idea around that with the increasing weather patterns um, that I find I found many, many species from the Caribbean that have washed up in the UK alive, many new species, um, quite common in the Caribbean, but not common in Britain. And they're generally alive. So the potential for these animals, I've actually got one in the tank right in front of me. I've got a Florida rock snail that washed up in 2015 um, with some goose barnacles, a big predatory whelk that would be unimaginably, you know, predatory if it, if it landed on our shores on a mussel bed. So yeah, with the increasing marine litter, there is there is a, a chance that invasive species will come across the Atlantic and start spawning or dropping babies in our waters. Um, but we don't know enough about it yet. We don't know if they if they're viable. As our waters warm, then yes, potentially. The thing with the Columbus crabs is even if they drop off, they probably won't survive long in our waters. It's just too cold. Although they are alive when they wash up, they've been amongst a cluster of goose barnacles and been out, you know, been out in the open ocean. But once they're in our waters, they would probably die, but and they only live on the surface of the ocean. So, but for other species, there's definitely. But if you find one, yeah, either stick it in a jam jar, you know, keep it as a specimen, um, or you know, you can leave it on the beach. It'll die. I think I think they're better off as a as a record as a specimen, really. Yeah, you you can make sure you record it definitely. Yeah. Send send it to your local records office, um, or and take it to a local aquarium maybe. Yeah, they might be able to set, alive. A little, set a little tank up for it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we reef and Yuki had some. Yeah, they're they're beautiful animals as well, aren't they? They're absolutely stunning. Yeah. 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 Um, Joe, different colours as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Joe, did you have a question? Uh, yeah, hopefully I had two because Gretchen just, can you hear me by the way? Yeah. Yeah, yeah so Gretchen asked the exact same question that I wanted to ask. Um, <laughs> but I was wondering how, how on earth do we um, educate people about it, that the plastic thing and the things that are so small that you said is best not to, to best to leave alone. How do we educate people that that really small aspect of of um, the ecosystem, um, when you know most of them go like you know, the sandhoppers and everything like this, which I find amazing and lovely. Yeah. Every, everything is, but how how can we how can we say to people, you know, that's uh, actually what you're doing needs to be, leave that bit. It's too small. I mean, it was such a a, a revelation what you just said to me to say that so it was brilliant so it's um it's difficult i mean yeah people don't necessarily like flies on the beach they don't like you know the sand hoppers they think they 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 call them sand fleas although they don't bite yeah. um but but i think if you explain that they <laughs> i mean poor things if you explain that they're an important food source for birds, everyone loves birds, everyone loves yep. mammals, you get hedgehogs on beaches, beach strand lines, um, yep. you know, so there it's an important food source and, and like Steve said, especially in winter when yep. food is scarce, you know, a lot of birds actually migrate to the beach, to the coast in winter um, because there is a food source there year round. 
Um, so that's, I think that's why it's really important. So bring in the cute stuff and make yeah. them the cute things. Yeah, well, <laughs> although, although there is a growing movement, even, even Springwatch and all these people are now doing some of the lesser, the lesser fluffy, the lesser, you know, cute animals <laughs> and saying, look, you know, the, you might not like them, but without yeah, them, awesome. you don't get this, this and this. And obviously, like I say, without those small invertebrates breaking down that natural debris on beaches, um, yeah. you'll lose you'll lose the sand dunes, you'll lose the pioneering plants. There'll be no nutrients on the beach. So you know, you know, they're, they're spending like a zillion billion pounds on coastal defences. Sand dunes are really good coastal defence, natural one. Um, yeah. It depends how badly people want that beach to have a concrete wall behind it. Or, or natural sand dunes it's it's a toss-up between the two because you lose them it's concrete wall yeah you know? it's fantastic it's so so good <laughs> yeah, I think it... replies. <laughs> it's, a, it's a really interesting one that and we do we do quite a lot of work as well with um yeah with with a lot of families and and kids and i i think every animal has its story and I think that can be a really useful tool as well, because I think as soon as you start talking about a creature and, you know, the really amazing facts about it, because, you know, every single animal has has incredible things that it that it does or, you know, that it obtains. So using those stories is a really good way, I think, of, of getting people to, to realise how amazing. Uh, mm. So that can be a really good tool. Well, as well. Also, also beach strand lines is, is the home to some of Britain's rarest invertebrates, scaly crickets, beachcomber beetles, these are very, very rare. They're probably way rarer than most terrestrial species mm -hmm. found in woodlands and heaths and things. They're incredibly rare. Um, yeah, to the point where there's sort of some that only live on one beach or two beaches. So again, if you sterilize those beaches, then, then that's mm -hmm. it, it's, it's extinct, it's gone. Mm -hmm. um, which is a shame. I think it's yeah. Um, I think just one last question. Um, Quare, would you like to... Oh, sorry, you're just on mute. Hang on one second. Uh, you just need to unmute yourself. Okay. Uh, it, it wasn't so much a question as a comment. I went out yesterday uh, to a beach just in, in Pembrokeshire and I recently discovered this thing called the Great Egg Case Hunt, uh, which is a website where you can register um, uh, any any um, cases that you find from uh, dogfish or skates or rays. Or, and you know, you were saying about what what can you do? How how can you get people more involved? And it's it's a very very small thing, but it's just sort of a connection. Um, and and I just find it just delightful that I can go for a walk and get a couple of photographs, just see. And I think I I, I now know um, what I'm looking for um, from mm. the website and to record it. And and whenever I go to the beach, the, the first thing I do is poke about with a stick in the in the kelp and the seaweed to see. Although, you know, we haven't done for months because of lockdown, but it's it's just really nice to be able to feel that you're doing something that gives you a connection, that you're contributing some extremely small way to just the recording of, of where these things wash up. Yeah, well, we, um, in fact, we recorded egg cases for the Great Egg Case Hunt. Um, around Dorset and on one particular beach we were finding lots and lots of a particular species and as a result of what we found uh, well partly as a result of what we found not exclusively um, but that beach that area of sea now that bay has become a marine conservation zone so you know by by doing that and recording your egg cases you can actually help you know, with the conservation of these species. So it's, it's and it's a really good thing to do and it, you yeah. feel good for doing it. Also, when you're on a beach, it gives you a sense of purpose because beach combing is, is just something human beings have probably always done. Now, you know, back in the day, it would have been foraging. You would have been looking for useful things, wood to burn, you know, dead animals even washed up. We could have used, everything was usable. Um, you could quite happily survive on a on a desert island just eating 
sand operas and finding things you watched. You know, that's, that's the reality of it. So we're, we're basically just monkeys walking around with sticks and, and we're, we're attracted to shiny objects and unusual things. And that's what it's all about. It's about getting, when you start looking for one thing, you start noticing other things. And you also notice changes across the seasons. So it's great to have a sense of purpose. And, and the egg case, kind of like Judy says, is a really useful tool. Uh, she's never underestimate your your handful of egg cases or your whatever. You should never underestimate that because it, it's people on the beaches that find things. It's not the scientists. They don't have time to go to the beach. So when you find a rare beetle, you find it's the people that find that. The people on the beaches, not the scientists. So never underestimate you know the sort of people power. And one of the things that I've found delightful, especially in the summer, is that if there are families on the beach and you're poking about with a stick, you can guarantee it is going to be a small child who will come along and say, what are you doing? And what are you doing that for? Can I help? Can I do it too? And it's just wonderful because the parents have been sitting there watching you. What is this crazy old lady doing on the beach? <laughs> And they have, they're they too polite, they're too yeah. withdrawn to say, what on earth are you up to? But let loose a child and the child yeah, is, yeah. what are you doing? And it's just a great way of getting them involved. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. One of the one of the um, really good things that I think uh, people well I know Nia uh, who's um, she works on the project as well she's really keen on getting uh, collecting smarty uh, bottle lids mm -hmm. that's that's one thing and then the fairy liquid uh, bottles as well and she's definitely had some some ones back from like the fifties and sixties and stuff yeah so, yeah um, they wash out of sand juice yeah uh, yeah that you can find uh, yeah. Nia did you have a question. I noticed you had your hand up before. Yeah, I was just, um, it was just, a, it was really interesting to hear about your view on um, beach cleaning. And as a wildlife trust, one thing that we do is beach cleaning. And we always try and get as many people out there as possible. Um, so that was, that was a really sort of good thinking point for me um, as someone that organises beach cleans. Could you, have you got any tips on how we can do that in a sort of, strand line friendly way or or is it a matter of if we are beach cleaning do we avoid the strand line or or what, what, what's your tips you can't yeah you can't really avoid the strand line because that's where the litter tends to to end up or a lot of it anyway um we've done beach cleaning over many many years um and you know and i would never say you know stop beach cleaning what we find now is um, it can be a bit frustrating when you go, you go to go beach coming and you're looking for goose barnacles and, and things that are attached to litter and you walk along and somebody's done a beach clean and they're, <laughs> they've all been removed. So we tend to look in the bin or the skip at the top of the beach to see what's in there on our way down to the beach. Um, but yeah, no, you can't really I think you have to get the litter off the beach and not only does it remove that litter from the beach but it also gives people the sense that they're doing something um, and I think we want to get as many people involved in looking after the sea as we can so it's really important that that people feel they have something that they can do and they can contribute um, so I would never say don't do beach cleaning. I don't know about Steve, though. No, again, no, no, again, we, we've organised hundreds of beach cleans over the years, and I think I think it, it, it's it's the lesser of two evils. May, maybe potentially um, have a have less people actually on the on the strand line itself, as opposed to having thirty or forty people basically trampling over exactly the same part of the beach. Um, it, it really depends on the topography of the beach. Some beaches, it doesn't matter. They just sand the tide will come in, take everything back out with it, and there's probably not a lot of life on there. What it would be a good idea to do, maybe, um, is to is to survey the beach, is to put some pitfall traps down and see what you've actually got living there. Um, but, but like Julie says, we don't want to stop people picking litter up because it's a major, major problem. Um, but the the offset of that is you are, you know, long term um, impacting on the on the habitat. I, th I think as well that people um, hand picking litter from a beach is much preferable to mechanical 
cleaning. So we don't like mechanical cleaning. Of no, beaches. and seaweed removal where people, you know, on blue flag beaches that, you know, part of the blue flag stipulation is that seaweed can be left on the beaches, um, but they all take it off at Bournemouth where, you know, our local beaches that are blue flag, all the seaweed is raked off every single day. Um, same with North Devon, Cornwall. It doesn't have to be removed. And that, that really is detrimental. That they, These beaches are barren. I know I've surveyed them and you won't find so much as a sandhopper on them. And that's that's definitely not a good thing. Definitely not a good thing. So it's, it's like Julie says, hand picking, maybe remove the biggest stuff. I'm not a fan of filtering out nurdles on no. beaches. Not at all. I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> and then you take all the fun out of it as well. <laughs> all the fun yeah. of it getting your tweezers and picking yeah yeah <laughs> yeah by hand and filling up your jar <laughs> yeah it's, it's unfortunate that litter yeah. has has almost become a habitat in its own right yeah yeah you know, yeah it has, it has. Yeah. It, it, that's that's a reality of it yeah you're right yeah well that was that was great thank you very much for that um and i think we'll we'll probably have to wrap it up there um yeah, your internet was it was it was fine. Like there was a couple of points where it kind of went in and out. But if anybody mm. didn't, I know there were some people that were having audio issues, but that wasn't to do with your internet. Um, so just to let people know that there will be a recording. Actually, I needed to check that first. I'll send out an email later. <laughs> um, yeah. So thank you very much for that. Um, and just to let everybody know, there is going to be a live beach combing session at eleven o'clock tomorrow morning. So myself and Nia. Um, so Nia will be out on the beach somewhere. So uh, hopefully we'll we'll have some interesting finds there. Um, and if anybody fancied the quiz on Sunday night, you have a chance to win one of um, Steve and Julie's books. So definitely come along to the quiz. Uh, and it's going to be a raffle prize, so you don't have to be a marine expert. Um, so yes, thank you very much. And if people aren't members and wanted to sign up to join your local wildlife trust, then that's a great thing to do to support local wildlife, um, which I think we can all agree has been ever more important in the last year in the lockdown. So um, that would be a great thing to do. So thank you very much, Steve and Julie. Thank you, thank you very thank you. much to everybody watching. And uh, yes, hopefully we'll see you all at the rest of the festival for the weekend. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye. Bye. <laughs>